The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. So we just take a moment of quiet. As we rejoice in this gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O oh God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. And the choir is going to bring us an anthem. Pay careful attention, please, because there will be a test later. Um, the composer of our first anthem, Sir John Goss, was a Victorian. He lived between 1800 and 1880, and he was the organist at St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, Sir John Goss was taught by Thomas Atwood, and Thomas Atwood was a pupil of... Mozart, yes. <laughs> there we go. Yes. So the, the words of the anthem are the collect for the visitation of the sick. And this expresses the idea which is prevalent throughout the Bible, through Old and New Testaments, of the link between salvation and healing.
comes more. The reading today is taken from Romans chapter 8, and it's verses 1 to 17, and it's life through the Spirit. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Margaret, for that beautifully clear reading. We're going to... Read together now, Psalm 100, when we say together, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. We're going to sing together now, uh, hymn 114, Come Down, O Love Divine. We'll stand to sing. Okay, sorry, we've, we've, um, right, so it's him 144, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, a beautiful hymn.
remain standing to say the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Um, uh, Liam's going to come up and uh, share with us a beautiful passage, beautifully read for us. Can I just pray for you? Please do. Liam, uh, sorry. Dear Lord, we thank you for Liam, and we just pray your blessing upon him now. We pray that you will speak through him, Lord. Lord, give him that, uh, that calm that we've been singing about and anoint him, Lord, to speak your word. And Lord, anoint our hearts too that we might hear and receive and understand and put into practice what you have to say to us. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, it's an incredible passage, and uh, as I was preparing this week, I was reading through it, and the first time I was a bit overwhelmed, to be honest. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is a lot going on here. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so um, when we get into it, I will be going through it verse by verse, so if you do have your Bible with you, that might be quite handy. Um, I was going to do a PowerPoint, but I wasn't very organized. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Um, how often when you get out of bed early or just have to get out of bed for work or something else is like going on and then you have the desire of staying in bed just for that little bit too longer and it's just too great you're like oh, just five more minutes and I guess to 10 and then 20 <laughs> uh, as a postman I have to get up early I mean not as early as posties used to but that's a different matter. Uh, I still have to get up early for me. My, my alarm is always at 6.15 and I have to leave the house by 7.15, 7.20ish to drive down to St. Austell. And uh, this is early for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an early bird. Um, however, it always gets to about 6.17, 6.20ish and I'm there like, do I need to get up? And then I realize I do need to get out because I need to earn money. And uh, I don't want to get out of bed. And it feels like my body is heavier. It's cold out of the duvet. And I'm having to think through what I need to do when I get out, whether that's shower or uh, make a coffee to get through the day or make my lunch, etc. It feels like a massive battle against my body. Who else is here with me? Who else feels that? Yeah, a few of you. <laughs> How often, though, when you do have a day off or you don't have anything really to get up for, you stay in bed, you stay that little too long, and then you feel a bit grotty. And then I feel like I've then wasted part of the day, I've not been as productive as I could have been, and there's this battle, isn't there, that within. A tug of war within. Our body is pulling us one way, and our inner self or our mind is pulling us the other way. We have been following the creed over the past few weeks and months, and today we're honing in on the life of the Spirit. And our passage is Romans 8, 1 to 17, as you've heard. And it's a, a huge passage within Romans. And it is the halfway point of the letter, and Paul is taking the Romans deeper into the theology of the Spirit. It's in importance within the fulfillment of the law and quite how it is the helper that Christ described it as. So before we delve into the main bit of Romans 8, I want to bring up the kind of key concept that Paul highlights in the previous chapter. 
So in chapter 7, Paul talks about how the spirit and the flesh are opposed. And they're opposed within us. But when we have the spirit living in us. And uh, within our innermost being, we want to do the good of the spirit when it lives in us. However, our flesh pulls us to sin. The sinful nature that was said in the passage. It conjures up, in my mind, this kind of tug of war image. The flesh pulling one way, the spirit pulling the other. The spirit pulls us towards righteousness and the flesh pulls us towards sin. Paul takes it even more extreme, describing the life of sin as death. Now, this is the context with which Romans 8 comes into. There is a lot more which Paul covers in Romans 1 to 6 and 9 to 16 that is well worth studying yourself. I can recommend The Bible Project if you want to watch a couple of videos. There are two 10 minute videos which give an outline of the letter, kind of an introduction. Um, and there is a Romans course which the Bible Society has created. I have a feeling, did someone lead one recently? Yes. Wonderful. Um, I've not done it, but it looks great. So, <laughs> and Romans is great. Um, so now we're going to look at the passage. So if you do have your Bible, would you like to open it with me? Or switch it on, whatever your vibe is. Um, to Romans 8.1. And it starts with, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul starts off this chapter with a bang. You will, you'll have heard people quote this passage a ton. It's an encouragement for us all. When we are in Christ, we are no longer condemned. Wow. Do you feel the weight of that? Can you feel the gravity of that realization? The Greek word that Paul uses for condemnation is a word called katakrima. This is an intensified word which is enlarged from the word krima. A krima means to judge or to sift out or to decide. And katakrima almost is the like, sentence has been placed on that judgment. And it takes the crema sifting, the judging or the dividing into a more serious nature. Someone is a judged guilty. They are catacremed. This highlights the enormity of condemnation. Our sin, what we have done, we ought to be condemned due to what we've done. All of the human race ought to be. We see all the way from Adam through to us at this very moment we have all sinned given into the flesh and that we should be condemned but we're not for we live in Christ verse 2 continues for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death verse 2 gives the context an insight as to why we are not condemned. Christ, through the fulfilling of the law, frees us from the law of sin and death. Huh? What Paul is saying is that Jesus has come. He's lived a life worthy of the law which he gave to Moses. You know, that boring bit which tells you what to do and what not to do in the Bible. And has broken the hold that sin and death has been clinging on to humans since Adam and Eve. We can live free in the spirit with it living in us. Verse 3 says, for God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sin and for flesh. Uh, for for sin, of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now this can feel a little wordy in our English translation. Paul is explaining within this verse that the law wasn't able to deal with the sin the way it needed to be within our lives. And the message tra uh, paraphrases this through describing the law like a plaster for sin. It dealt with the emergency of sin but it didn't deal with the deep issue. 
God sent his son to heal the wound of sin within the world, to deal with it once and for all. The way he had to deal with it was to take on the sinful flesh, to live in the sinful world and die as the ultimate flesh sacrifice for all of us, breaking that bond that sin had on humans. In verse 4, it says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is Paul tying up this neatly packaged little explanation of what Jesus did at the start of this passage, which is to defeat sin so that we are freed. He essentially is saying that this needed to happen so that we can live free in the spirit and not live a life condemned by sin. Having to try and to fail keeping the law, which doesn't even do what it needs to do, like the people have been doing up to this point until Jesus came. So Paul uses this short paragraph to launch into the main point of this chapter, to live in the spirit, not to live in the flesh. Now let's look at a bit of a chunk here, verses 5 to 8, which says... For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now I've paired these verses together because as you read it, it feels like Paul is saying a familiar thing a few different ways. And he's compounding upon <clears throat> and building up to make the gravity of the point he's making. Someone who is living a life where they give in to their desires, allows the flesh to dictate their life, is not living in the spirit. Paul starts with explaining that those who live of the flesh will be thinking about the things of the flesh. If you are giving in to the desire of, let's say, gossip, the more you give in, the more your mind will be thinking about it and as it consumes your life. However, setting your mind on the spirit, living in the life of the spirit, your minds will be set on that. This isn't easy stuff. This is what our entire life is bound around, precisely this struggle. As we live a life within the Spirit, we live deeper in relationship with Christ. The flesh is pushed further out and it doesn't fully go because we aren't Jesus. We can see this and the sad cases of famous Christians in leadership recently who have supposed to have been living life in the spirit however the flesh has been there in their lives and they've given in to those sinful desires so flesh equals sin death hostility to god and the spirit is peace pleasing to god and life in its fullness now, some people struggle with the use or paul's use of flesh within this passage so another translation can be sinful nature human nature it depends on your personal inclination so in verse 9 it continues you however are not in the flesh but in the spirit if in fact the spirit of god dwells in you anyone who does not have the spirit of christ does not belong to him i think you ought to be getting the picture here now the life of the spirit is the life with god and it is freedom from sin the forgiveness the relationship with Christ, the rejection of flesh. One of the things which I have struggled with most around this concept, and I remember thinking about this when I was doing my degree and while we studied Romans, was do we actually have to constantly choose not to give in to the flesh when a desire pops up, when a temptation arises? Or do we expect that as we live a life in the spirit, that these temptations will disappear magically? Wouldn't that be great? 
We would all love it to be a clear one or the other, wouldn't we? In a world where everything is nuanced and obviously means that things aren't clearly one thing or the other. We've often used the term of things being black or white. I hesitate to use this phrase. Often people will say such and such is a grey area to be in the middle. It's between black and white. And this is where I've probably placed this issue. We, we decide to live a life in the spirit. We choose the right things. That weakens the power of the desire of the wrong things within us. However, we still have to decide not to do the wrong things. We still have temptations each day that we have to push away. So the answer to it is kind of yes and yes to both. It's almost like they impact each other, really. Verses 10 and 11 I've paired as well. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Paul is responding within this section to the inevitable questions which will arise where people are asking, well, if my body is dead because of sin, how will I be alive in a world when rejecting flesh and accepting the life of the spirit? So if I reject flesh, then I'm dead. How can I still live in the world? And it seems a pretty obvious and straightforward answer, like Jesus was raised from the dead. So your mortal body will be raised from the dead caused by sin into a life of the spirit. Simple, right? Well, yes and also no. Because despite us experiencing this death of sin and rebirth into the spirit, people often call this baptism, because we still have these mortal vessels which we are made from flesh, prime example here, not prime, sorry, <laughs> we still have that temptation which pulls at us. We are still living in that tug of war which I mentioned at the beginning. So that's a lot of information that I've just said to you. So we're going to have a couple moments of silence if you'd like to close your eyes and uh, just let that kind of sink in a bit before I go on to the last section. Um, yeah, Lord, thank you. So verses 12 and 13 continue. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Sorry, Paul, but you've already said this a lot, haven't you? Well... Yes and no. Paul brings about that language of debtor here in this bit. Uh, we are in debt. We have fallen short. We have sinned. There's a price to be paid for our sin. For living in the flesh. For giving in to our temptations. If we live according to the flesh, as Paul says, that debt will be paid through death. Our death. However, Christ offers to pay that price for our freedom. The imagery of slavery to sin is one that pops up throughout the Bible. We have been bought out of that slavery to be free and to live a life in the spirit. Do you, everyone still with me? Yeah? <laughs> I hope this isn't too jargony. That's not a word, but I hope it's not too full of jargon for you all to, to grasp it. Because a lot of the same words over and over again. Because sin... Entered the world in Genesis, Christ has to set us free. That's probably how I could describe this sermon in a few words, really. Um, but in order to live within this world, 
and free in Christ. We need to live life in the Spirit. Christ has set us free, and we need the Spirit in us to live that life worthy of that. The Spirit puts to death the things of the flesh, those sinful things. Through living right, we become right. Through living, uh, we align to the right things. We align to the life in the Spirit. In verse 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are God's, are sons of God. So when we live a life in the Spirit, we inherit something. We become children of God. God is pleased when someone rejects the sinful ways of the world and chooses his right way, the way of Jesus. In verse 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This, I feel, is a crux moment in the passage. We're not saved, brought back from the brink of death, brought into freedom through Christ in order to fall back into those patterns. The term used for what Christ has done for us is grace. And there's a term which was coined by a German pastor called Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. Bonhoeffer was one of the church leaders in Germany who was condemning what Hitler was doing in the 30s and 40s and ultimately was killed for his involvement in an attempt to overthrow the Nazi regime. And he termed, uh, coined the term cheap grace within his book, The Cost of Discipleship. I'd recommend reading it. It's quite a small book, but there's a lot of dense information in there, and it's a lot to understand. Um, And describing, he described cheap grace as a grace that requires no repentance and no sacrifice. It's understanding what Jesus has done, but accepting that in a cheap way. Well, if he's done it for me, then I can go and sin freely because I'm forgiven anyway. The reality in life is that we will fall to the flesh and we will sin, but we must repent. We must sacrifice. Just because Christ has forgiven us of our sin and our future sin, doesn't mean we can sin as we like it doesn't mean we could um this that is what makes that grace cheap repenting isn't a small thing to repent is a deep remorse a turning from our previous way of life to turn back to the life of the spirit in this period of lent it's a time for us to reflect on justice We are preparing for Easter. We must think about our spiritual life. Prepare ourselves spiritually for what is coming over the Easter period and to recommit to the life of the Spirit as children of God. And then I've paired the last two verses, 16 and 17, together. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him and there is that last thing this life isn't easy living life in the spirit isn't an easy life it brings suffering I mentioned in a sermon I gave at the evening service I think about a month ago saying that we, as we imitate Christ, our life imitates Christ's. So as we live in the, the life of the Spirit, we will face similar struggles to that which Christ faced. A number of the apostles have faced, faced martyrdom, another say of, uh, way of saying they died because they wouldn't give up their faith in following Jesus. Our reward as heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus, is secure as we accept our life in the Spirit. And this life is laden with struggles. We still live in a sinful world. We still live in a flesh body. We still live with that tug of war within. We will face resistance from the world, the world that doesn't fully know Christ. We are called to share him to the world, to show and share with people the life 
in the spirit that we are living. People won't like this. The enemy doesn't like this. However, at the end of this passage, Paul links on to what comes after this passage. That we may be glorified with him. That is that we may join Christ in eternity. That our present sufferings will pass. That they are nothing compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. So in the creed it says we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in committing to the life of the Spirit. Where we are free in Christ and co-heirs with him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we can know this truth. Thank you for the words that you spoke through Paul all those years ago. And I pray that they would settle in our hearts. And that we would desire to live in your spirit. Thank you, Liam. Yeah, the, the choir is going to come now and share with us uh, an anthem. And just while they, just while they do that, while they're coming forward, I just just want to say thank you to Liam for sharing, and just really encourage you to to dig deeper into Romans. You know, for probably for most of us, we these are familiar words. We've heard them before, but yes, do come forward and organise yourselves. And but there are things in there that are hard to understand, and you know. When we are presented with those hard to understand things, we have a choice, don't we? We can either park them and we can say, oh, well, that's something, I don't understand that, I'll just leave it. Or we can say, Lord, help me to understand and we can probe, we can do things like read the, um, subscribe to the Romans course, the, which is great, um, from the Bible Society. Very, very easy to follow and, and understand and really helpful. We can try and explore these things and, and then we grow and growing is better than just parking them and forgetting. So, sorry, right. Sir John Stainer is the composer of our anthem now and it's part of a bigger work, The Crucifixion, of which we'll hear more over the next month leading up to Good Friday. Sir John Stainer was taught by Sir John Goss, who was taught by Thomas Atwood, who was taught by Mozart. Mozart, absolutely spot on. Now, the words of this anthem are those of John chapter 3, verse 16, probably the best known and best loved verse in the Bible. And it really summarizes, I think, everything we believe as Christians. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that those who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life.
We're going to move now into a time of prayer. Lord, we pray for our church in this time of transition. Thank you, Lord, that you have answered our prayer for you to stir up people to pray. Thank you that so many people prayed this week during our 24 hours of prayer. We thank you for the prayer meetings on Friday evenings, and we thank you for the ongoing prayers of the prayer team ministry. Thank you that people in other churches have told us that they are praying for us. Lord, we are grateful for all of this, and yet we would ask you to continue to call your people to their knees, to humble themselves before you and to seek you, Lord. We need you to act, to pour out your spirit upon us. We need you to equip us with your love and your power because the needs of our community and our world are so great. Lord, grant us a fresh revelation of your power that will transform us and through us transform the world around us. Lord, we bring before you the needs of our hurting community. We pray for those who are homeless in our community, for those with addictions, and for those who are struggling in poverty. Guide us, Lord, to play our part. Meet their needs for support with mental health, accommodation, and adequate resources. And we pray for our hurting world. Strengthen all those who are working for peace. Cause their voices to be heard. Silence the voices of hate and amplify the voices of love, respect, and compassion. We pray this especially for Gaza and for Ukraine. Lord, you taught us to ask and to keep on asking. You said, ask and you shall receive. So we bring our requests to you in expectant confidence that you keep your promises in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we're going to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we have some uh, notices to share with you, and hopefully we've got a slide. Is that, is that going to come up? Um, the first point that... Brilliant. Thank you, Tiff. Great. Um, the first point is not up there, um, and that is that each week we're, we're going through our four marks of membership, and um, the mark that we want to talk about today is giving, um, that we, uh, you know, the fact that we give to the church of our time, our money, our talents, um, is a mark of our discipleship and a mark of our membership here. We believe that everything that we have comes from God, and he calls us to invest that in his work, in his people, in, in working for him. So it is our generosity that enables the work to continue. We need money to heat this huge building, to, um, to run our events, to support people in need, to continue doing all the things that we are doing in the community. Um, so we are very grateful to everyone who contributes. But if um, if you don't, or you'd like to find out more about how you can give to the church, then we've got information at the notice board uh, at the back there by the kitchen. And the other thing I just want to highlight is a wonderful celebration. I know Linda's been coming around with a card for us to sign for Liam Crabtree, um, and just saying a huge congratulations to Liam. Um, He's going to be awarded St. Piran's Cross 
this afternoon, and that is for his amazing work that he's been doing with, uh, with, with men in our community. He has this meeting called SOAR, S-O-A-R, uh, that meets on a Wednesday, and they've been, uh, has been attracting a, a, a real big group of, of men who come from challenged backgrounds, many of them, and that God is really doing a fantastic work. It's one of the most exciting things that's happening in our church at the moment. And uh, so it's really great that it's been celebrated. And I would encourage you to, to pray for Liam and, and Mark Davey and all the others, Lee, uh, Niles involved in it, all those who are involved in that work. We're really touching people's lives. So that's wonderful. Um, now, we've got some things on the slide here. Um, I just want to bring, draw your attention to uh, that we have Easter flowers do Easter. Easter flyers at the back. Do pick one up if you um, uh, if you uh, if you remember. Not if you, but remember to pick one up as you go out. Um, there's training for those involved in the prayer tent, um, and the spring fair is coming up Saturday, 23rd of March. And uh, Linda wanted me to ask you for contributions of Easter eggs. They need large ones, and consider asking two or three people to get together and maybe buy a big one or contribute some money towards one, okay? All those things are on, I think there's another slide, Tiff, the next one. Yes, all those are on our What's On sheet. There are hard copies at the back, and I'll give you all the details there. Rather than me going through them all now, you can read them there, or uh, they will come to your email inbox uh, this afternoon if you're signed up to Church Suite. Okay. Phew, right. Um, we're going to sing... Uh, again now oh no sorry we're not quite there we've got I just need to uh, remind you that uh, there is a service this evening um, our 7 p.m. service an informal service and we have uh, a very special person Gary McCormack is going to be speaking he's been uh, they've had a weekend with the with the men with Gary sharing about his experiences in Northern Ireland and how God just transformed his life from being involved in the troubles there uh, to really seeing God change him. So that's a, a wonderful testimony that he has, and he'll be sharing tonight. That will be really great. Um, if you're new to the church, do pick up a Connect card from the back uh, or, and a welcome pack. Um, talk to one of us about that if, you are, uh, if that concerns you. Um, okay. Right, we can now sing our last hymn. Uh, 314, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. Wonderful hymn to finish with.
Amen. Let's just pause for a moment. Think about what we've been singing. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light. He is with us now. Just take a moment. Realize his presence. To worship him in your heart. Hallelujah. May the blessing of God Almighty, that great Father of glory, the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us now and always. Amen. Please be seated. If anyone would like prayer, the prayer team are, are waiting over there. <laughs> 